you're here. Today we have uh, a company that has been attending and coming to TDRT for a long time and someone like Philip Smolin is the Chief Strategy Officer here on my side who's been in the industry for a long time and so just want to welcome you to the show, Philip. All right, well thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Well, Amobi is a platform that offers uh, marketers all kinds of uh, special tools. You want to hear a little bit about that, but uh, where are you? Um, it's sunny where you are. Tell me a little bit about your situation and how you're adapting your home office. Well, home office is the key uh, phrase there. So uh, I am in a very pleasant quarantine, I have to say all in all, uh, in shelter at home in uh, Redwood City, which is the Bay Area for San Francisco. Just a little bit of San Francisco. I'm in San Francisco, so hey, you're a neighbor. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I'm assuming you're getting access to groceries okay down there? Everything okay? Uh, we are. Um, it's been a pretty fascinating few weeks, uh, I think, for you know everyone. We probably started, well, as you know, uh, a little bit earlier um, than you know most of the rest of the country. I think that was a smart move. Yes. Uh, kind of you know hard not to go a little bit stir crazy. We have two um, young kids, uh, an eight-year-old son, six-year-old daughter, and so doing all the, the homeschooling while doing everything at work, uh, obviously is a, is a challenge for everyone. Um, you know, for us, as you mentioned, we're an ad technology uh, provider to both the buy side and the sell side, um, you know, heavy focus with uh, marketers and agencies, but also broadcasters and programmers as well. And the last few weeks have just been um, pretty amazing in how busy they've been, uh, because on one level, you'd look at kind of everything playing out in the industry and the economy, and it, it's scary stuff. I mean, it's scary mm -hmm. on a personal and family level, but also at an economic level. And obviously, you have some industries that are you know, at, at risk of potentially total collapse. And so it's very easy to automatically think, oh my gosh, the entire advertising and advertising subsidized industry are simply going to collapse along with that. But in reality, what we're finding is that uh, we are spending a massive amount with our uh, our brands and agencies that we work with, um, really giving them a lot of market insights um, as they are rethinking their overall strategies. This isn't just about like media planning and where you move some dollars or where you pull them back from, but this is about rethinking entire holistic strategies. So things are very busy right now, um, which is kind of crazy with everything else going on. I want to go into that in more depth, but. Uh <clears throat> I also uh, wanted to make sure that people were aware that you're you're not going to shave that beard right until this is all over. Is that the situation? That right. is uh, that is accurate. So I started this uh, at the beginning of the uh, shelter at home. What was it about three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago? And uh, my intent is not to shave it until all of this is done. So uh, we may want to check back in in a month or two or three or four and see how that's proceeding. Okay, here's mine. Okay, so. Um, What's, what's the quick idea about Amobi? Give us the sort of uh, short statement, the short pitch. So anybody who's new to Television Nation here will know what Amobi is before we go sure. forward. So we're an ad technology platform provider. <clears throat> what does that mean? We provide uh, a suite of tools to um, marketers and to agencies to be able to plan, buy, optimize, and measure um, all of their holistic converged advertising. So what does that mean with Converge? We're really focused at the intersection of what is TV and digital and social media and how you as, um, as a marketer use your digital data assets, your first party data, your CRM, third party data marketplace, but how you use much smarter audience data in order to create unified audience strategies. How do you talk to the same audience across all those channels in an orchestrated way. And that goes from linear television into connected television, online video, display, mobile formats, and over into social. And on the, the sell side of the market, we also provide a suite of tools um, to broadcasters and programmers. It's a very TV-centric focus as opposed to like display publishers for um, essentially the equivalent about how they can use their data and their clients' data to be able to forecast and package media on an audience basis and to be able to measure like business outcomes on behalf of their clients for that to really be able to understand at a more effective level what is the ROI that their media is delivering. Now, they may still transact in TV on a Nielsen currency, but being able to overlay a custom audience target on top of that 
significantly increases the value for the marketer. And it also increases the ROI that is being delivered by that media seller and therefore really enables them to argue for and defend a higher price point and a higher net revenue overall from their media. So that's where we fit within the industry. And the one other thing that I'll add to that, which is very relevant to kind of this, this COVID period of time that we're going through is yeah. um, advanced analytics are a big component of what we do. It's not just about kind of the media transactions and how you do it on a programmatic basis, but it's about the intelligence that you want to put into that process. And so we are providing to a lot of our clients right now advanced uh, kind of market insights that help them understand what are the types of content that consumers are engaging with right now? What is that content discussing? What is the sentiment of it? How does it relate to their brands? And these are all insights that ultimately inform what their messaging strategy should be, as well as their media buying and media optimization strategies. So I, I know you have some statistics or some numbers to talk to us about how uh, you guys are advising your clients. Is that correct? Um, it, about this challenging atmosphere? Because uh, that is the, the thing. I mean, it puts digital marketers in a serious position to enable um, the advertising community to flourish and support other businesses. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to drive the money around, circulate, right? So how, tell yeah. me a little bit about um, how you're advising your clients or what you're, what you know. Sure. So why don't I pull up, let me uh, share my screen with you and I'll give you um, an example or two that we can take a look at. Uh, so hang on one second while I turn this on. We we're going to share we some birds in the background. I can hear that. <clears throat> All right. I think I'm sharing the right one here. Okay, great. Okay. So uh, do you see my screen now, Tracy? I do. I do. Okay. Awesome. So um, what we do with part of our product set is um, an analytics tool set called Brand Intelligence. Brand Intelligence uses um, an anonymous audience panel. It's very large. Uh, it's a 50 million consumer panel on a, on a global basis where we have the opportunity to observe and analyze the type of content that they are uh, you know, browsing and reading about and to be able to generate insights from that. So, you know, at the very beginning, the very onset of uh, kind of the, the epidemic um, and now pandemic, we began providing insights to our clients. Now, I'll share with you a few slides that are uh, generic to an industry vertical, in this case, um, the quick serve restaurant vertical, the QSR vertical. In reality, for our clients, what we do is very bespoke analytics, okay? But the, the way to think about this is that if, if you're, you know, the, the CMO or anyone in the marketing organization on behalf of a quick serve restaurant or uh, an agency of record uh, for them, right now you're looking at the COVID landscape wondering like, oh my gosh, you know, what should I do? And everybody, I think, at the very early days, first few days, had the same kind of knee-jerk reaction, which is COVID is bad. I do not want my brand associated with kind of negative uh, sentiment content. So therefore, simply suppress any content that has a COVID association. I don't want to be associated with it, right? And that unfortunately has um, a very dangerous kind of side effect, which is right now the single most important thing that everybody needs, all of us need as a society, is good journalism. We need good, accurate data because good decisions come from good data and we want people to be prepared and not to be panicked. But that comes from Visibility, journalism. right? Visibility. I, I've heard that a lot and that's what we're doing. We're trying to keep the industry visible, connected and talking. You don't want to go dark, you know, as uh, I think uh, Jane Clark recently said in an interview with us on our show, Television Nation. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, certainly in a period of time, if you think back even just like two weeks ago, certainly three weeks ago, there was a lot more spin than there was data. And so it's very important for like high quality news and journalism to be supported. And so, you know, coming back to kind of QSR, like all, all industry verticals had kind of this knee jerk reaction of like, oh, don't be associated with COVID based content. But here's the thing all the audiences that they want to reach, all the audiences that are their customers or their prospects are reading that content. And, and of course, no surprise here, we all know that's simply an umbrella label and there are lots of different sub-components, sub-conversations going on within COVID, right? So let's take a look at you know, what we have in um, you know, COVID-related content that is specifically focused on home delivery and food delivery-related topics. 
And so what you'll see here in this bubble chart is that basically the size of the bubble is telling you how dominant a certain word or phrase is within the conversations that are occurring. This is across some social listening components as well as what is uh, you know website, um, you know page information and things like that. Oh, and Philip, so, Philip, can you um, actually read those words off the screen in case it's blurry for some people because of bandwidth issues? Just tell us which what are the the bubbles we're looking at, if you don't sure. mind. Sure. So we're looking at this analysis. <laughs> The size of the bubble is the dominance of a word or a phrase within kind of this online content that people are reading about that they're consuming. And the color is the velocity, meaning is the consumption of that content increasing or decreasing? And you can use your cursor to point things out. That will show. Great idea, right? So here we have kind of our scale that shows, hey, if something is bright red, it means it's really trending up in kind of like the internet content and how many people are consuming or reading about that content. So what we see here is that Postmates, which is you know a delivery service, is one of the top trending uh, sources of content that people are reading about. And what you'll see here is an example of one particular article. This is on HuffPost titled, Now You Don't Even Have to Touch Someone for Your Takeout or Food Delivery. Right. And so we then have, you know, high uh, increases in consumption around home delivery and food delivery content. So what you see here are just trends in essentially the social conversation and the news consumption conversations that are going on. And what, are if, the other red, what are the other red bubbles? Uh, curbside pickup, uh, kitchen, contactless, um, diners, your orders, um, outbreak. Some of the ones that are, um, you know, decreasing a little bit uh, are around, um, uh, let's see, you know, delivery fees and commission fees, right? So depending upon your brand and how you see yourself currently playing or you want to play within, you know, the market right now, it's important to get a sense of like, what are people focused on? Because if you were a quick serve restaurant, you might go, oh, we do not want to be associated with any COVID content. But that would actually miss a really big opportunity because what we see is there is a lot of content and conversation going on related to home delivery. So now that here's something really interesting. Let's look at the next slide here. So this is a competitive landscape chart that is mapping out individual brands now within the context of all this content and these conversations for um, what is the consumption of the content and the brand and their association, this is the key thing, mm -hmm. with delivery or curbside pickup. So what you're seeing here is that McDonald's is absolutely dominating the market. Within the media landscape, there are more articles and people reading those articles that are focused on McDonald's and their delivery or curbside pickup. I didn't and, even know they were delivering. Not, I mean, I don't. Well, so, I don't. So, so here's the thing: like, you have to you have to really kind of dive into the details to then start to look at things like sentiment analysis to understand whether the association is necessarily a positive or a negative. And if you're the McDonald's marketing team, and by the way, I'm speaking about them generically. I'm not speaking about them like as a client or anything that I know that they're doing or not doing. I mean, simply using it as an illustrative example. But if you're McDonald's or Taco Bell or Subway or Wendy's, you need to think about, well, what is your business strategy in this new COVID you know, economy? And so are you focused on curbside pickup? Are you introducing delivery services? And if you are, then this is actually the basis of what probably becomes a very important messaging and media planning strategy on your behalf. And right? you're able to pull all that from all your data. And then are you able to advise them um, the the tasks they should pursue or the campaign they should pursue to get this message out across all of these platforms. I mean, isn't that's what a movie does, right? You pick yeah. this up and then you. Yes. So that's, that's exactly right. So, so our goal with insights like these and, you know, for our, this is, this is just a, an industry vertical snapshot. It's not tailored to a specific brand. For the brands that we work with in their agencies, we do very, very bespoke analyses that drill into very deep details around sentiment, and it gets into information around understanding 
what is you know the geographic distributions what are um, kind of the content distributions around websites and content areas search terms etc and so all of this is different types of insights that are think of it as different prisms right on on kind of like that that crystal and so you want to look at that and you want to turn it around and be able to look at all this data to be able to start mapping out really at the top order function, what is your marketing strategy? Should it be changing right now? If yes, what are some of the messaging implications? What's likely to resonate well, what is not? What might be tone deaf in the process? And then translating that into media strategy. Sorry, I interrupted, but that word tone deaf is so critical that, you know, because I see a lot of people making mistakes, celebrities are making mistakes. Uh, I know brands occasionally are making mistakes. It's um, it seems empathy, right, and, and being proactive to help people seems to be a critically important uh, message for marketing. I think, I think so. In fact, let me let me pop to a different window because okay. I want to show you something else. I think you'll find interesting. <clears throat> and it's intuitive, but just because it's intuitive doesn't mean that people automatically think to look at it. At so. some point, I um, I also um, are, are you picking up all of this data using uh, the ACR data that I know you're working with now from Nielsen. Is that part uh, of the experience? Very interesting. So in fact, uh, yes, um, subsets of this data come from both our uh, Nielsen Grace Note panel for ACR as well as the Inscape panel for ACR. Um, um, we think it's very important to use multiple Vizio. data sources. They're Visio. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, so to the point that you were just um, making, if we take a look, can you see my screen again, Tracy? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So this is um, an update from a couple of days ago that is for the automotive vertical, right? And if we take a look in here, um, this is really interesting. So what we see is that the top term for automotive industry related topics is ventilator, right? Wow. It's a ventilator, right? Ventilator. And so what we see within this is very specifically, it's not just um, ventilator, but it's also GM's undertaking of a va massive ventilator creation That's project has been right. received a high level of engagement. <clears throat> right? So now if you think about this, if you're a brand, right? Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of the brands, you know, in the automotive vertical, but just put yourself in the position of the CMO, you know, or the CMO's team. It's like, this is a big conversation about your brand. And so what voice do you want to have in that from both an earned media as well as a, you know, paid media perspective? And so I'm not saying what GM should or should not be doing here, but I am pointing out that for any brand, all good decisions start with good data. And you want to get you know that visibility into what's going on in the conversations within the industry. Now, if I flip on to um, another slide here for just a moment, because I want to um, see what's on that previous slide and uh, off the rec I mean, another time. I'm curious. But go ahead to your next slide. I'm. Yeah. I'm I mean, we can talk about it off off offline. <laughs> yep. So you know, we also have um, top associations around like car dealerships and, you know, buying a car online. And what we see is actually, there's still a lot of content being read about the car buying process, but not necessarily at dealerships. People are aware of dealerships as being kind of like, well, if I go onto a dealership lot, that's kind of, you know, potentially risky. Um, and so they are doing a lot of searches for what is online car buying. Right. And in fact, people are also doing searches that, you know, appear to be related to looking for deal um, opportunities. So there's still engagement going on with kind of like, you know, new car content. And let's see if there's a, a good highlight that was called out in here. But there's a lot of virus stuff mixed in there very at the top and all the way through those uh, numbers. It's, it's thematically involved all the way through, but it goes back to the point of, you can't, as a marketer, just look at COVID as this singular topic. You really need to deconstruct what it means into these very different conversations mm -hmm. and then look at, well, what about your audience within those conversations? What are they going to care about? And so some of that may be very relevant for you as you get into demographic profiles about how the content consumption is trending differently 
depending upon who you are and where you are and life stages and things like that. I mean, this is all classic marketing 101. And the point of it, I guess, is to say that COVID doesn't so much represent a, a change in marketing 101. It just represents a change in some of the conclusions that you reach out of it. What should your strategies be? What should your media strategies be? Another dimension of this then becomes um, the media landscape itself, you know, has been shifting because a lot of brands use tent pole events uh, like live sports. Those have gone away, right? For at least the next few months, probably longer, you do not have those tent pole events that you previously had entire annual media plans built around. And so what do you do about that? The audiences aren't gone. The, audience are st the audiences are still there. They're just there in different media now. And the, the, the environment that you're advertising in, that media um, experience that the consumer is uh, viewing is going to be different. How do you respond to that? How do you adapt to that? Not only that, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, you know, I know my daughter is on my computer using Zoom or, uh, you know, whatever. She's navigating things because I have a bigger screen than she does. I mean, the, the fragmentation has always has been there now for a long time. We're well aware of all that. But now you've got more people in the house using the same devices. Right. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's complicated. So what what are you doing to come uh, to to sort all that stuff out? And also, uh how um, are you advising specific clients at the moment? Can you reveal anybody you've been talking to or any any interesting decisions or uh, anybody being innovative? I mean, is there anything you can tell us about what's really going on with specific brands? I know, I know. There, there actually are a lot of interesting things and uh, I can't uh, actually talk about them because we cannot talk about specific clients and what they're doing uh, because a lot of this stuff, frankly, is you, ask, you know, I have to ask these questions, but it, it is your journalistic responsibility to ask. And it's my fiduciary responsibility to politely decline. Okay. Um, but and so jokes aside, the reason why is that a lot of these things ultimately become um, competitive advantages. And so, you know, many brands are very hesitant to, you know, really discuss kind of some of the strategies that they're engaging with, which is why I wanted to pull up some industry vertical kind of examples for you to, to illustrate the concept. So let's okay. simply play it out. So what's been happening, as I mentioned, is, you know, everything started with this knee jerk reaction of using suppression targeting. I am running my ad campaigns, but I do not want them to be associated with this negative, you know, COVID concept. So that has very quickly evolved. One of the things we do within our tool set um, for marketers is we provide them uh, custom uh, contextual targeting capabilities. So how you use content to either target specific topics or how you use it to suppress specific topics. And so you could really think of it as kind of being like, you know, a, 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 like a, a pyramid or a tree. So there's a COVID topic, but as we said, you, you start breaking it down. There's very, very scary news around mortality rates, right? And things like that. And it's a pretty safe bet. No one wants to be associated. Actually, I'm going to come back to this. No one wants to be associated with that content. But then there's this other topic underneath COVID, which we said is around things like food safety, right? And takeout and delivery services. That's actually a very positive environment for the right brands. Um, home and gardening. People are stuck at home. Well, guess what? It's a great time to be catching up on all of your gardening projects. It's springtime. And right? you know what? I, I, every, there is a, a lack of yeast available that you can't get ye baking yeast anywhere, uh, even from online distributors, you know, from across the nation. And I think a lot of people are baking. That's another great topic for people to pursue, like baking. Yep. Anyway, that's just an observation. So so what we what we have is insights that are specific to verticals, but more importantly, that are tailored to brands. The brands and their agency teams are utilizing that to rethink very tactical media strategies, but also using it to rethink, um, uh, uh, I should say media tactics, but also using it to rethink marketing strategies, the stuff we already talked about. I don't need to repeat those. What happens from there is that that cascades down into an evolution of what the media plans are where media is being, budgets are being allocated to. Um, and that can be across linear TV plans, like I said, connected TV, online video, into all the digital formats. Um, and where you need to move that budget around or how you optimize it for different audiences, for um, different uh, contextual environments, uh, based on the examples that we gave. Now, interestingly, one of the other things that we've been doing, and, and this 
This was very um, uh, bottoms up within our company. This was conceived of by several people who were kind of like hands on with our clients. But we launched very, very early, I think about three weeks ago at this point, an entire um, uh, uh, PSA uh, program, so public service announcement program, um, to promote access, uh, basically to um, bring information and promote uh, linking through to the CDC. And that's also been expanded on a global basis for the WHO. And so what we realized here was that, okay, we have media that is going underutilized because it's scary COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, rem remember three weeks ago, um, uh, so much of what we were hearing uh, at kind of like the, the the news level was about spin as opposed to good data. And so some of our employees looked at that and they're like, wait a minute, you know, instead of just helping advertisers to avoid that content, let's start promoting good data within that content. Let's start promoting PSAs within, you know, uh, CDC and the WHO. And so that's an entire, separate from everything we do with our clients, that's a, a separate program we've spun up that a lot of our clients are participating in. Um, so whether that's Universal McCann, UM uh, Worldwide or um, Publicis, we have partners um, you know, on the sell side, including some of the exchanges like you know, uh, Rubicon and Index. There's a pretty wide variety, I think about 30 or 40 partners who have joined with us who are either donating money or they are donating impressions in order to be able to help distribute good messaging that is going to be productive for people. And it allows us to continue to monetize, albeit at a reduced rate, what is this important kind of, you know, uh, um, professional journalism content, even though it's still COVID related. So on one side, we're really focused on helping our clients navigate this landscape and be able to, you know, still drive their business forward. Um, and on the other side, we're also trying to promote, you know, social good with you know, distributing important data for uh, that media where it is probably otherwise unusable by most advertisers. Do you see any particular um, uh, innovative response, uh, you know, using certain platforms that are more proactive or uh, different types of um, advertising that you think are working? Uh, you're able to pick that kind of stuff up or is it really just about getting the good messaging out there or associating yourself with positive messaging? Where, where is the innovation happening? I think uh, it's a really interesting question and there's a pretty broad gamut of what we're seeing. And I think it, it very much depends on what is the industry um, that, uh, you know, a particular brand is with. <laughs> Obviously, if you're in travel, right, you are not, advertising your travel services right now. But we are seeing, you know, some advertisers within some brands within that vertical that still want to be relevant. And they are using it as an opportunity to kind of maintain awareness of their brand and market, but they're promoting good behaviors, right? You know, uh, such as, uh, you know, using hand sanitizer, washing your hands on a regular basis. Like we all know how consumer um, psychology, you know, uh, works. And we know that you need to have reinforcement of messages in order for them to really sink in for all of us, right, as individuals. And so you have brands that are doing a social good um, by really focusing on, you know, positive education and reinforcing good behaviors. But in the process of doing a social good, they're doing a business good at the same time. And so I think we've also seen within you know, some verticals, um, uh, I think there have been a number of automotive brands who have done this that have increased the amount of messaging uh, that they're doing, which is focused on their values, um, you know, what they're doing for their employees and reinforcing the importance of kind of like community and that this is something we're all in together, right? As opposed to being, you know, siloed off, even though we may all be kind of like sheltered at home at the moment. So, you know, every brand has a unique response. If you are, you know, in that, that uh, quick serve restaurant vertical, um, you know, you can actually drive business, you know, uh, opportunity right now. And frankly, that should not be viewed as a negative thing. I don't see that as being opportunistic. I see that as protecting jobs, right? And that is critical right now. But how do we keep an economy, you know, limping along, right? But still moving forward, but adapting to the new environment that we're in. Do you think, and so every brand's different. Do you think, um, what do you think about the upfronts becoming a virtual offering? 
Well, the interesting thing about um, TV, and I'll refer to it generically because this is true about anything that is premium, high demand content, whether that's in linear distribution, connected TV distribution, or online video distribution. The nature of that content is it's high demand and it is supply constrained. And in fact, given the reductions in live events um, and in uh, new content development, um, a lot of it is gonna become even more supply constrained, right? So the upfronts exist as a mechanism to be able to you know, uh, buy and sell into the future, right? So what are guarantees over you know, multiple quarters for you know the television programming year. And that's very different from kind of like the online programmatic auction world, right? Which is where you have a massive amount of supply and buyers can kind of cherry pick within that process. So all of that is background to say that when we look at the upfronts, there is the, the upfront events, right? Which is really the marketing of the upfront. And those are going to virtual. But the upfront process itself in terms of um, you know buyers making you know large commits for you know a multi-quarter um, spend profile, we don't see that changing. Now, not the mechanism. Of course, some of the spend levels are going to change. Negotiated rates are you know are going to change. There's going to be a lot of volatility in it compared to prior years, of course. But the base process of negotiating those upfronts. We don't see that changing. We don't see the upfront process itself going away, just the marketing of the upfronts going to a virtual basis. Well, I'm kind of curious, and um, we, we probably need to wrap it up actually, but I'm kind of curious uh, uh, because, uh, you know, are they gonna make them available to anybody? Do you have that special link? Are they gonna open up the process to, you know, the world? It'd be interesting to see um, how they're gonna handle all that. But anyway. I, I agree, it'll be interesting to see. Don't know the answers. Okay, so were there any other slides you need to show? Because we, uh, we're, uh, I'm, 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 I think we got a lot of fantastic information, a lot of great statistics. Uh, it's interesting to see how you're able to access um, in real time all of this data and uh, show the trends and how to advise your clients. Yep. Yeah, I will give you specific examples, but like you said, you can't do that. I understand that. Um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't touch on? I think we covered a, a good profile of things. You know, if there are additional things you find that would be of interest to you or your audience, you know, please let us know. We're happy to, to follow up on that. Um, and then for you know any of the people who are listening in, if they would like to you know understand what we're able to do to help their brand navigate these choppy waters and be able to look at some of these in insights on a tailored basis to their brand. Um, we're always happy to have that conversation when there's always basic information that we can share because right now we just want everyone in the industry to be as effective and successful as possible because this is about helping the economy keep moving forward and we all have a role to play in that well thank you very much very much very well said uh this is philip smolin who's the chief strategy officer of amobi which is a m o b e e dot com sorry i like my brain uh and that's it. This is Tracy Swedlow, host of Television Nation. You can find all of our uh, shows at tvotshow.com. And feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to be on as well. Uh, Philip, I hope to see you at a TV of Tomorrow Show event in real life. That would be a pleasure. Or on here another time, we might, you know, produce more conversations going forward. Thank you so much. And say hi to everybody at Amelia. So thank you so much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye.